This year, Black History Month has seemed especially relevant. It comes on the heels of a year that not only brought the subject of police brutality and racial injustice back into the headlines, it landed in the midst of an ongoing battle over American history. When does it begin? Who gets to tell it? And how central should slavery be to the American story? At the start of the year, Joe Biden, on his first day in office, signed an executive order that rescinded Donald Trump's 1776 commission. That was a panel tasked with releasing a report on, quote, patriotic education. But it had no professional specialists in U.S. history on it. It was supposed to counter the New York Times' 1619 project, a Pulitzer Prize winning endeavor that reframes U.S. history, starting it in 1619 when the first slaves were brought to the colonies. The 1619 project aims to highlight the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans that have often been neglected. Trump, of course, called the whole thing toxic propaganda. It's classic culture wars. And increasingly, the target of the right's assault on this kind of black history is a man named Ibram X. Kendi, the multi-award winning author, professor and founding director of Boston University's Center for Anti-Racist Research, has become one of the country's most in-demand commentators on racism. And he's throwing his history hat into the ring with a new book co-authored by Keisha Blaine called 400 Souls, A Community History of African America, 1619 to 2019. It includes 90 essays from prominent writers and thinkers who document US history in their words. Like the 1619 Project, it too starts its narrative in 1619. It's been met with much praise, but Kendi is not without his critics. His last book, the best-selling How to Be an Anti-Racist, was dubbed a 21st century manual of racial ethics. A New York Times review described it as the most courageous book to date on the problem of race in the Western mind, one that may be our best chance to free ourselves from our national nightmare. Conservatives, though, dubbed his thinking totalitarian, pointing to how the book sharply divides society into only two distinct categories, racists and anti-racists. Some say that dangerously broadens the definition of racism, diminishing its impact. Earlier, he joined me to discuss his latest book and explain why, when it comes to racism, there is no in-between. 100 Souls offers us essays written by 90 authors who each write about certain periods across a 400-year history from 1619 to 2019. But given everything we saw in 2020, the uprisings following the killing of George Floyd, uh, the racial disparities we're seeing with this pandemic, in terms of the long view of black history, how does 2020 compare with some of the other iconic years that came before it in America? Well, in, in many ways, what came before it and, and, and what we, we, we write about in this in this book that I co-edited with with Keisha Blaine explains 2020 and, and explains, you know, our current moment. And, and you know, that's what history does. It, 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 it allows us to understand why black people were dying at higher rates from COVID-19. And it, it caused us to explain why black people were still dying from police violence and why there was police violence at the police violence uh, protest. Uh, you know, it, it allowed us to explain what happened in 2020. Yeah. And and where do, how, 2020 is how iconic, how memorable a year for American history, for black history will it be in, the, in coming years when people look back? Oh, I think it's going to go down similar to, to 1968, which of course was a, was a, a memorable and critical year in, in American history. Of course, it's, you know, of course, people remember those twin assassinations of, of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and, and, and Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, but also, that was a year of tremendous sort of demonstrations and protests, or even the year of 1919, uh, which, at least for those who study African-American history, there was these series of, of assaults on, on, on black neighborhoods or in communities or the year 19, 1865. Uh, you know, I think 2020, particularly those of us who study race and the history of racism, will, will I think, go down be, in, into a, a pivotal year. I mean, it, you know, as you know, it's, yeah. some people have estimated that there was a larger series of demonstrations in 2020 than any period in American history. Yes. Uh, with the uprisings in the wake of the George Floyd killing. Um, Ibram, you've become the face of the quote-unquote 
anti-racist movement, uh, in part because of your uh, previous book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. In it, you say there's a battle uh, between racists and anti-racists, which some might say controversially, you say there are only two groups, only two camps, racists and anti-racists. You have to be part of one or the other. So who's winning that battle between the racists and anti-racists? Well, I, I, it's hard to say who's 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 winning necessarily. Uh, I, I think that in many ways both sides are, are achieving wins. Um, and 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 just so we're clear on this battle, I mean, you, you essentially have people who are battling to keep policies in place, practices in place that are maintaining racial inequities and injustices, and then you have others who are battling to, to eliminate those policies, to change those policies, to create an equitable and just nation. Yeah. Uh, and the book, that book in particular, faced criticism from the right and even from some on the left as well for creating this sharp dichotomy between racists and anti-racists, leaving no room in between. For example, you write in your book, even Obama was pushing racist ideas when he talked about the, quote, erosion of black families and the need for black self-reliance. Uh, and the New Yorker's uh, Khalifa Sane uh, in a review wrote that if the word racist becomes capacious enough to describe both proud slaveholders and Barack Obama, then it may start to lose the resonance that gives it power in the first place. Is that a fair criticism? The overuse, the expansive use of the R word may in the end undermine its power? Well, first and foremost, I, I'm, a, I'm a scholar. Uh, and, and I am thinking about defining terms based on evidence in history, not based on its outcome. So that's a, making a political yeah. choice. In other words, if we define it in this way, it's going to have this effect. So let's not define it in this way. No, that's not how we should define terms. We, we define terms based on reality. And whatever an effect it has, if we define murder as murder, and that, lead, and that causes us to recognize all these murders or no murders, we shouldn't go back to define the term. I, mean, I think it's a ridiculous response. And, and, but instead, I define a racist idea as any idea that suggests a racial group is superior or inferior. So that's it. Just don't say a particular group is, is better or worse than another, or a policy, a racist policy is one that leading to injustice, uh, racial injustice or racial inequity. So promote policies that lead to justice and equity for all. Yes. And one of the things you say very clearly in all of your books is that racism is about policies and outcomes. It's not just about people's inner prejudices or bad words. Uh, and you suggested when someone asked, I think it was Politico in 2019, that asked contributors to offer outside the box ways of addressing political problems, uh, dealing with policies in our society. And on the topic of inequality, you, of course, grabbed a lot of attention when you proposed passing a constitutional amendment to create a department of anti-racism. Uh, it would be comprised of experts who would pre-clear local, state, federal policies, making sure they're not causing racial inequity. They'd even have the power to investigate uh, racist policies uh, in private institutions. But what do you say to the critics who say, that's not only is it impossible uh, in, in America right now that such a constitutional amendment uh, could ever be. People agree to have a group of unelected experts overrule everyone else, even if it's for the noble goal of preventing racist policymaking. Well, first, I'm happy that you, you, you prefaced that with give us an out of the box, completely left field, uh, you know, policy, uh, you know, thing to implement. And, 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 and that's precisely what, you know, what, what I proposed. But I think that, let's take the example of federal preclearance of, of changes to uh, voter precincts or changes to uh, uh, electoral laws that were instituted via the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that had a tremendous impact in preventing states from implementing policies that disenfranchised black and brown voters, because it first had to be pre-cleared with experts who can assess the impact of these new voting laws. 
And, and so all I was basically stating is, what if we extend that out to education, to the environment, to the economy, yeah. you know, in which we're making sure that the policies we're instituting are not going to disproportionately harm any racial group? What's wrong with that? What, what's wrong with creating yeah. equity and justice for all? It would force uh, a lot of people to become very self-aware in a way that perhaps they're not right now, people in power. You've argued that the root of racism is self-interest presumably white self-interest. Uh, yesterday, we had on the show author Heather McGee. Uh, her new book, The Sum of Us, talks about the need to dispel what she says is the myth that racism is in white people's self-interest, that white people have just been made to believe that. Have a listen to what she said. The zero sum means that white Americans who, you know, are going without health care, are struggling to pay student loan bills, are still voting for the party of their perceived racial interest and against the party of their perceived class, of their real class interest. And so if we don't call out the zero sum, as I try to do in The Sum of Us, if we don't say to people, you know what, some people are selling you hate for profit. And honestly, you may be desperate enough to buy it, but it's not helping you feed your families. That was Heather McGee speaking on this show on Tuesday. Uh, do you not agree with her that racism has been a tool used for political purposes, for profit by people in power, not necessarily to benefit one racial group over another always? Oh, I do. And, 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 and that's precisely... And so the term that she used was perceived self-interest. So what happens is you have powerful, uh, let's say, white folks in positions of power who are selling other lower-income white folks that it is in your self-interest to support, let's say, uh, policies that remove uh, gun control from this state so that now you can, quote, protect your families from those so-called Latinx invaders, black criminals, and so-called Muslim terrorists, only that that's led to this epidemic of white male suicide by handgun in those very states. In other words, it wasn't in their self-interest. And, and so, you know, yeah. that's what's happening. You know, people are sold. They believe it's better for them when it's really not. But it is better for other people because then you vote for them and then they are able to, to pick your pocket in other ways. Yes. The LBJ line about picking pockets is something I actually uh, raised with Heather on Tuesday. Uh, one last question, Ibrahim. In your new book's intro, you write, I don't know how the community has survived as much as it has been deprived for 400 years. Black history is almost spiritual striving to survive the death that is racism. And I wonder, reading that, when we have a president, a new president like Joe Biden in office right now, a president who at least today acknowledges the existence, the effects of systemic racism, uh, we have a, a black and brown woman serving as our vice president. Does all of this leave you hopeful? You say racism is a cancer we've caught early. Uh, do you think we'll be seeing some treatment of that cancer, real treatment, during this administration with all of its appointments and all of its racial equity executive orders, or no? So I actually don't derive hope from uh, who necessarily is, is in power and whether those elected officials have stated that uh, systemic racism is a problem and they're committed to root rooting it out. I derive hope from a simple truth that in order to bring about change, we, we have to believe it's possible. And I'm saying that because there were people who were feeling hopeful when they believed that, that Hillary Clinton was going to be elected. And, and then suddenly, of course, you know, she was not elected and Donald Trump was. And then their hope went away. Their hope went to hopelessness. And then for some of those people, they were paralyzed in that sense of hopelessness. And, and so I don't want that to happen again. You know, we should be pressing for a just and equitable America, no matter what, no matter who's in power, no matter what they're saying. And, 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 and in order to do that is we have to recognize that it is that push, it is that struggle, uh, it is that recognition that we can bring about change that's going to fuel it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.